Hello everyone. Diabetic foot infections are not like our everyday skin and soft tissue infections. They are much more difficult to treat, they don't respond to the same antibiotics, the duration of treatment is different and surgery is as important as the right choice of antibiotics. So in this video I will share 6 tips that will help you ensure the best possible outcome for your patients and help you avoid the most common mistakes. So tip number 1. Just because your patient has diabetes and they have cellulitis, so a skin infection on their foot, this doesn't make it a diabetic foot infection. For us to diagnose a diabetic foot, there has to be tissue damage as a consequence of unrelated diabetes mellitus. Usually this tissue damage appears in the form of an ulcer. So there has to be an ulcer or necrotic tissue. This is diabetic foot. If it's infected, this is a diabetic foot infection. Why does this matter? Well, if this is a skin infection, but there is no ulcer, no necrosis, we can treat it like normal uncomplicated cellulitis, which means we can use our regular antibiotics that cover only Staphylococcus aureus and Streptococci. We don't have to go broader. So we can use either anti-staphylococcal penicillins, first generation cephalosporins or clindamycin. All of these should get the job done really well. And why is this important? Well, patients with diabetes are often elderly, they often have other chronic conditions. All of this makes them vulnerable to Clostridium difficile associated diarrhea, a very common and potentially deadly infection that is the result of broad spectrum antibiotics. Not to mention other side effects, drug interactions, so we don't have to go broad. Our usual antistaphylococcal antibiotics should be more than enough. Tip number two. Okay, there is an ulcer and it does look inflamed. We all know the typical signs of a skin inflammation or infection. Redness, warmth, pain, maybe permanent discharge. But the thing is, in advanced diabetes mellitus, every single one of these signs can be absent. In advanced diabetes, there is also often peripheral arterial disease. And with impaired circulation, if there is no blood, there is no redness, there is no warmth. But what is even more common is diabetic neuropathy, which affects the nerves that transmit pain. So our patient's sense of pain might be diminished. And this is important because many times patients with unregulated diabetes are not even aware that they have an infection on their foot. They simply don't feel it. It doesn't hurt. And this is why whenever you have a patient with diabetes and fever, especially signs of sepsis, and you don't know the source, always check your patient's feet, remove their socks and examine their feet thoroughly. Don't take your patient's word for it, see for yourself. It's not like they're going to lie intentionally. They really don't know that they have an infection. And in diabetes, any damage to the integrity of the skin can lead to infection. Uh, a seemingly insignificant thing like an infected nail bed can lead to bacteremia and sepsis. Okay, tip number three. If an ulcer does look infected, especially if there is pus, we are all tempted to take a swab, aren't we? Please don't do that because this is completely useless. Yes, we do need to take a high quality microbiological sample, but the superficial swab is not it. First, you have to do a surgical debridement. If you can't do it, consult a surgeon. So after this dead tissue is removed, then we can take the swab of the base of this ulcer after debridement. This is a good microbiological sample that can help us afterwards, but a superficial swab, please forget it, don't ever use it because it will do more harm than good. There is no such thing as a sterile ulcer. You will always end up isolating several demonic bacteria and then it's very difficult to ignore this and you will end up using unnecessarily broad spectrum antibiotics. So please forget about superficial swabs. Tip number four, if there is an ulcer, there is also dead tissue and dead tissue is packed with bacteria. Our antibiotics cannot reach these bacteria because if there is no blood flow, there are no antibiotics, right? So this has to be removed physically, meaning you should consult a surgeon who will do a high quality debridement as soon as possible because timely surgical treatment is as important as the right choice of antibiotics, which leads me to Tip number five, always be on the lookout for skin abscesses 
and osteomyelitis. In our normal cellulitis, skin abscesses are usually very, very painful. I mean, cellulitis is painful to begin with, but when you touch the area affected by a skin abscess, your patient will literally jump. But remember, patients with diabetes often have a diminished sense of pain, so you cannot rely on that. Instead, check the entire surface of this redness of inflammation and look for signs of fluctuations. It, it, it feels kind of like a pressurized water balloon, right? If you find something like this, you know your patient needs surgery because, again, abscesses will not go away with antibiotics alone. The antibiotics simply cannot penetrate a huge abscess and get to the bacteria that it contains. Next, osteomyelitis. All of these diabetic ulcers, they usually form on prominent bony surfaces. And this makes sense, doesn't it? Because the tissue gets pressured between a rigid bone and a rigid surface or a rigid shoe. Ultimately, ischemia happens and necrosis happens. With necrosis, you get an ulcer. So whenever you see an infected ulcer, you should always be on the lookout for possible osteomyelitis, especially if this is a large ulcer, meaning more than 15 to 20 millimeters in diameter. If you can see the bone or if you can actually probe the bone, all of this makes osteomyelitis much more probable. And then, of course, again, you will consult a surgeon to do a debridement and take a high quality sample of the affected bone. Of course, this is paramount because in osteomyelitis, the duration of antimicrobial treatment is several weeks, if not months. And we want to narrow down the spectrum of the antibiotics that we use. And to do this, of course, we need a high quality sample. If you are not sure whether it's osteomyelitis, of course you can employ imaging. Many times a plain x-ray will be more than enough, but sometimes you will need a CT scan or even an MRI, which is much more sensitive and it offers a more detailed view of the affected foot and the affected bone. Without timely debridement, patients with osteomyelitis and skin abscesses will respond poorly to antimicrobial treatment or they might not even respond at all. And if these complications are not recognized right away, this can be a clue to the fact that there might be osteomyelitis or an abscess somewhere, this poor response to antibiotics that should work. So this is another clue for clinicians. Which leads me to the tip number six the choice of antibiotics. And yes, this is a source of a lot of confusion. So let's start with this. For mild infections involving very shallow ulcers, you can use the same antibiotics as for simple cellulitis. But if surgical debridement was necessary, if there was necrotic tissue or pus, you do need to use broader spectrum antibiotics. In addition to covering Streptococci and Staphylococcus aureus, you do need to cover gram-negative rods and the anaerobes. How can you do this? Well, for example, clindamycin will cover streptococci and staphylococci and most of the anaerobes. So you can simply add another antibiotic to cover the gram-negative rods. You can add a third generation cephalosporin or sometimes ciprofloxacin, or you can simply use beta-lactam, beta-lactamase inhibitor combinations like amoxicillin clavulinate or piperacillin tazobactam. These will cover a lot of gram-negative rods they will cover streptococci, staphylococci, and they will also cover the anaerobes. Yes, they will. You don't have to add metronidazole, right? It's the same with carbapenems for intravenous treatment. Just like piperacillin tazobactam, they will cover a lot of gram-negative rods, streptococci, staphylococci, and the anaerobes. The question here is, should you routinely cover MRSA and Pseudomonas, the two superbugs? And my answer would be, just consult an infectious diseases specialist. But if you want to know the logic, here it is. If your patient is septic, you should cover everything. So no mercy. Cover MRSA, cover Pseudomonas. Just take two sets of blood cultures, go as broad as you can, and then you can de-escalate when you get the microbiological test results after a few days. But if your patient is not that sick, then you have the time to think. And for MRSA, now, if you read American literature, you will find that whenever there is pus, you should routinely cover MRSA. But this is because community-acquired MRSA is a huge problem in America. But this is not the case in Europe. So in Europe, you should cover your normal methicillin-susceptible wild-type Staphylococcus aureus. However, wherever you are, 
in America, Europe, anywhere, if your patient does have risk factors for hospital-acquired MRSA. So, recent exposure to antibiotics, recent hospitalization, nursing home residents, you should cover MRSA. Why does this matter? Well, because community-acquired MRSA and hospital-acquired MRSA are not the same thing. They are all susceptible to linezolid and vancomycin, but community-acquired MRSA is also susceptible to clindamycin, doxycycline, trimethoprim sulfamatoxazole, usually. Not always, but usually. In short, wherever you are, if your patient has risk factors for hospital-acquired MRSA, you should cover it with vancomycin or linezolid. But in the United States, for purulent infections, you should cover at least community-acquired MRSA. And for this, again, you can use vancomycin or linezolid, but you can also use trimethoprim sulfamatoxazole, clindamycin or doxycycline. Now, what about Pseudomonas? Don't worry, this is a lot easier than MRSA. Some of the antibiotics that I already mentioned, like piperacillin tazobactam, carbapenems like imipenem or meropenem, sometimes even ciprofloxacin, have a decent chance of covering Pseudomonas. The resistance rates vary, but in many areas they are quite likely to cover Pseudomonas. That being said, Pseudomonas likes moist, wet wounds full of exudate, like venous ulcers, for example. Diabetic wounds, on the other hand, are usually dry. So generally speaking, you don't have to stress about covering Pseudomonas routinely in diabetic wound infections, at least not in the US and Europe. It's a little bit different in the rest of the world, but in these areas, really, you don't have to routinely cover Pseudomonas. Just keep in mind that you have to treat diabetic foot infections longer than uncomplicated cellulitis. So at least 10 days to let's say two weeks for milder infections. If there was extensive surgical debridement, this can extend all the way to four weeks. And if there was osteomyelitis, it's even longer than that. But again, consult an infectious disease specialist. If you feel like you learned something in this video, you will learn a lot more in my free online course on recognizing serious infections early. If you work with acutely ill patients, I highly recommend you take a look. Thank you for watching. Good luck out there and take care.